Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cleveland Park Congregational United Church of Christ on a beautiful, beautiful spring morning. Uh, we are an open and affirming congregation, and that means whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. We, of course, always welcome visitors. So if you're visiting us for the first time today, there is a uh, sign-up sheet in the entryway for you to give us your name and address, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're at home, uh, you will find a visitor link in the chat room. Also a reminder, uh, if you are uh, on Zoom to mute your devices, and if you're in the sanctuary, please mute your phones. The, uh, I have one uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, remember that next week we will have a coffee hour conversation with Reverend Love on the subject of getting free, which was our uh, sermon topic last week, as you recall. Uh, also, the, the technical people who provide our hybrid service wanted to remind you, uh, please do not unplug the routers that are plugged in in the parlor. Someone has been unplugging the routers and that doesn't help. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Callie for another announcement. I don't have time for the short person stool anymore. <laughs> so uh, good morning, everyone. I wanted to talk about the, the mass poor peoples and low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington that has been mentioned in the bulletin a few times before. Um, I'm going and I want someone to come with me. So I thought, let me share a little bit about it. And if you're free and interested, it would be so great to coordinate and move up. So the poor people's campaign is a grassroots campaign that is connecting the dots between systemic racism poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, the war economy, and religious nationalism, because they all feed each other, right? The Poor People's Campaign points out that 43% of the US population, 43% is poor or low income, which includes 52% of all children. Regarding the upcoming March, they offer this. We assemble and march on June 18th because any nation that ignores nearly half of its citizens is in a moral, economic, and political crisis. There were 140 million people who were poor or one emergency away from economic ruin before the pandemic. Since March of 2020, while hundreds of thousands of people have died, millions are on the edge of hunger and eviction and still without health care or living wages. Billionaire wealth, meanwhile, has grown by over $2 trillion. After low-income people turned out in record numbers in 2020, the needs and concerns of the 140 million are going unaddressed and voter suppression continues unabated. There are abundant resources to meet our needs and we march to summon the political will to do so. America must have a moral revolution now. It is time to nonviolently disrupt, protest, shake up, and alter the direction of our nation towards love, truth, justice, and equal protection under the law. So there's a whole day of gathering on June 18th, beginning just before 10 a.m., going until 3 p.m. I'm thinking I'll do like the first half. I don't know that I can be on the mall the whole day. But anyway, if anyone's interested and would like to, to kind of be together, please feel free to reach out. I'll be around in coffee hour afterwards. Otherwise, my, my email is in the, uh, the member directory. Thank you, Kelly. Today is Pentecost when we mark the movement of God's spirit in tongues of fire. Kelly's already given us a demonstration of what that looks like. We will continue that as we light our candles of hope and healing for the world. On this Pentecost Sunday, our service is about words and the power of words and the danger of words. And so now I invite you to join in some words in our call to worship, which is from Psalm 104. 
O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. They all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And let us pray together. Holy God, you spoke the world into being. Pour your spirit to the ends of the earth, that your children may return from exile as citizens of your commonwealth, and our divisions may be healed by your word of love and righteousness. Amen. Our opening hymn is, O oh God, our help in ages past. Please rise as you are able. On Pentecost, we remember the moment when the Spirit of God moved through God's people, stirring them to listen and to speak. This is our opportunity to listen for the Spirit of God in our lives, in our world. To listen, however, we have to be silent. So let us silent the voices in our heads and our hearts and listen for God. So get comfortable, close your eyes if you wish, and breathe, and think about the week that has passed. What are the joys we've celebrated. The 
and what concerns have we endured? Are there things we have done we shouldn't have done? And what maybe should we have done that we haven't? Now let us turn our thoughts to the week ahead. In that week, what help will we need from God or from neighbor? And what can we do to nurture the love of God and love of neighbor in the world? Let's pray. We thank you, Holy God, for the joys of this past week. We mourn with you, compassionate God, for all of its pains. We confess all we have done to hurt or not done to help. Move in us and through us today and through the week to come. Amen. God created us, lived with us, knows what we have done and not done. God makes us new every day, lives in us, moves in us through the Holy Spirit, and offers us grace. For this forgiveness and for every new day, thanks be to God. And now, held in the arms of this God, who is both father and mother, we pray together the prayer of Jesus, our brother, using a different set of words. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom his heaven, the hollowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, Forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Share as forgiven 
and forgiving people share the peace of God with each other. So if you are at home, please unmute yourself and we'll see you on the magic screen. If you are in peer in person, please greet each other. Pumping of elbows rather than hands, please. The peace of God be with you all. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. And as we come back together, please remute your devices. We join together for our silent peace prayer. First, place a hand over your heart. Repeat after me. May peace and health be with me. May peace and health be with our friends and family. May peace and health be with this congregation. May peace and health be with our city and our country. May peace and health be with this entire world. Amen.
A reading from the book of Genesis. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the, all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. A second reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even, among, even upon slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls out the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, Alan. Um, and I'm going to apologize to the tech team. I'm going to move around a little bit, but I promise I won't leave the chancel. I just know this makes your life a little harder, and I apologize for that. I am a word guy, and I always have been. My mother tells me that I started speaking late, and she was kind of worried. But then when I got started, they worried that I would never stop. 
I have settled down a bit since then, fortunately, that even now I spend most of my time with words. I read books and have written a few. In my job, I read and I write and I edit what other, people's, other people write. Our culture has become increasingly image focused, as you may notice from Snapchat and Instagram and so forth. But I am still logocentric, focused on the word. Words are beautiful. Words are powerful. Words are slippery. And sometimes they're dangerous. Today I want us to think a bit about the beauty of words, the power of words, the danger of words. But first, let us pray, and I recognize the irony of this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today's scripture stories are two of the stranger stories from the Bible. The first comes from fairly early in the book of Genesis, where there are some weird little tales. We all know Adam and Eve and the serpent, and Noah and the ark, and Abraham and his family, but tucked in there in between, we've got Cain murdering Abel, and some angels kidnapping human women, and Noah getting naked and drunk and the genealogies, lots of genealogies. And in the middle of all that is the story of the Tower of Babel. The people of the earth, the story tells us, were creative and they were ambitious. Most importantly, they could work together because they had one language and they could talk to each other. They could make plans. They can even maybe make a strategic plan, right? So they settled on a nice plain and they decided to build a city. Not just any city, but a big city. A huge city with a really tall tower. A tower with its top in the heavens. Why do you think they did that? Pride, right? What else? What's that? They did it because they could, right? They did it to draw attention to themselves. They did it because, hey, we can do things like this. They did it so they would not be scattered abroad and forgotten. How does God respond? He confused. Now, it's kind of weird, right? God says, God gets worried. If they could do this, God says, they could do anything. They are one people. They have one language. They can work together. They can do anything. It sounds like the plot line from an inspiring sports movie, right? We can do anything. We can work together. But this worries God, which frankly I find a little bit disturbing. There's nothing more alarming than an insecure supreme being, right? So God comes down to earth and confuses their language so they can't understand each other. God makes it impossible for them to work together. And just as they feared, they are scattered abroad over the face of the earth. That's why the place is called Babel, from the Hebrew word to confuse. It can also be translated as the gate of God, which shows you how slippery language is, right? Before Babel, the people of the earth had a common language and a common culture. After Babel, the next 1,300 pages of the Bible are full of migration, 
and conflict and cross signals. As the people scattered abroad over the face of the earth struggle to deal with linguistic difference and cultural difference and just plain old human cussedness. The second scripture for the day, and by the way, Alan, thank you. I know that's a hard passage. There's all sorts of city names that are really hard to pronounce, so thank you for doing it. The second story for the day comes from the New Testament book of Acts. It is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a Jewish holiday, 50 days after Passover, Pente for 50. It marked the revelation of the Torah, of God's law, to Moses and the people at Sinai. It marked the day when they became a nation committed to serving God. It was a major holiday, and Jerusalem was full of people from all over the known world, speaking lots of languages. It was also 10 days after the ascension, the day when the risen, the resurrected Jesus ascended bodily into heaven. All the disciples, all of his followers, were gathered together in one room, having gone through some weird things in the past month and a half, not knowing that things were about to get a little weirder. And suddenly, there's the rush of a violent wind and tongues of, tongues of fire whirl through the room with the flame touching each person in the room. And suddenly they begin talking, each speaking a different language. It was like Babel, a person con perfect confusion of languages. But this time, the people could understand each other. They were in this international city full of people from lots of different cultures with lots of different languages, all in the same place. But this time, suddenly, they could understand each other. Every person in the crowd heard the disciples speaking in their language. This was a transformative moment. Whether you, from, whether you were from just down the road or halfway across the Mediterranean, you could hear the good news of Jesus preached in familiar words. The gospel is no longer limited to one people, one culture, one language. It was for everyone. People who were scattered abroad over the face of the earth were brought back together. The Spirit of God who had dispersed the people at Babel reunited the people at Pentecost. The Spirit of God who had destroyed the tower at Babel created, we say, the Christian church. So at Babel and on Pentecost, words can bring people together whether they have a common language, like at Babel, or the ability to speak and understand different languages, like at Pentecost. Language can help people understand each other, work together, build community together. This is powerful. Language is powerful. What are some examples of how language helps people work together? I'm gonna to move down here because it's hard for me to hear. I'm getting a little, going a little bad. What are some examples of how people, language helps people work? Singing together. By the way, wasn't that spectacular? Singing hymns together. Right, making, pla making, 
We're full, of, we're full of lawyers in this town. We make contracts. We make agreements. Absolutely. Teaching is a great example. Hmm? Absolutely. Communicating, telling stories. Um, praying together. Cheering at a baseball game, right? And think about what happens here. What are some important shared words in this community here? Scripture is important. Nurture is important. Thanks be to God. What is our mission? To nurture love of God and neighbor in the world. What do we say every Sunday morning at the beginning of the service? And where you are in life journey, you are welcome here. The time with the children. The song we sing after the benediction. God be with you till we meet again. These are words that recreate our community every week. And of course, there are more intimate examples. Family stories, for instance. As my mother lay dying, my brother and father and I spent a long week telling and hearing stories. And that experience over 20 years ago still has created a vital bond between the three of us. Think about a phone call with someone you love who is far away, but that communication, that exchange builds that relationship. The simple process of reading a story out loud to a child or to an adult. And the simple act of whispering a secret. These shared words can be very powerful. They create community. They create relationship. They create, some philosophers say, they create reality. Words have power, which is why we should use them carefully. Ellen has told us that faithful Jews do not speak the name of God, because if you use someone's name, you have power over them. And so when they are reading Scripture and they come across the name of God, they simply say, Hashem, the name. They're careful about the words they use because words are powerful. They are powerful because they can create. They're also powerful because they can destroy. That's the shadow side of language, right? The powerful things that can bring people together can also divide them, can cause harm. Sometimes it's a simple piece of miscommunication. If you've ever traveled in a world country where, with another language, you've probably had the experience of stumbling into trouble by trying to find the right word and coming up with precisely the wrong word instead. Someday I'll tell you the story of the waiter in Paris. And sometimes it's carelessness. You all have known me a long time and know that I can occasionally be oblivious. I don't always pay attention to what I am doing or the impact I'm having on somebody else. It's the nature of being big and clumsy like I am. And as a result, I sometimes say something unintentionally unkind. I did it a week ago in this room for forgiveness. But sometimes this harmful use of words is intentional malice. And here's where we can most directly see, clearly see the dangerous power of words. 
people intentionally using words to hurt somebody, to destroy a relationship. What kinds of examples can you think of for that? Sorry, one more time. Stop the steal. Political language. Yeah. Internet shaming. Trolling. Blaming, right? Being. All of this. Uses of words intentionally hurting the visceral impact of hate words can be intense this past week i read an article by an african-american professor who had written an article about racism and about the hate mail and hateful hostile voicemails he received he wrote to read white racist vitriol can be traumatic. To hear white racist vitriol intensifies the impact. One listens to the inflection in the voice, its volume, its nervousness, and its hatred, its terror. I registered the words physiologically mood swings, irritability, trepidation, disgust, anger, nausea. Words do things. They carry the vestiges of the bloody and brutal contexts gave them birth. Words do things. These kinds of words directed at a stranger are simultaneously powerful and cowardly. And sometimes words of hate are directed quite intentionally at those we know and supposedly love. Several years ago, on vacation, we were forced to listen as a father in the next apartment lashed into his adult daughter with words that still shake me to my core. The stories of Babel and Pentecost demonstrate the power of words. Our own experience, particularly in the current climate, demonstrates that words can also divide people, can also damage people. That is why, as a word guy, I want to be careful with words. I want to recognize the beauty of words, the power of words, and the danger of words, which is why I get angry when I see words used lazily, carelessly. I get angry when I hear people using a word just to provoke a reaction just to attract attention to themselves. It is common in our politics, it's inescapable in the press, and it's all over social media. People calling each other fascist or communist or groomer or totalitarian, and those are the nice words, right? You hear them on television and read them in the paper and do not go into the comments section. It gets even worse. This is lazy language, using words just to hurt, just to score a point. And when they're called on it, when people call out this hateful language, people say, oh, I was only joking, or I'm just asking the question, or the most laziest, I'm just saying. But that is laziness. If you have to say something's a joke, it probably isn't a joke. You cannot hide behind your words. They expose who you are.
Today's Pentecost, the day we celebrate the movement of the Spirit in our lives. On that first Pentecost, the Spirit manifested in words, words spoken, words heard in every language. Those words brought people together, spread the good news of Jesus, and created the Christian church. Today, that same Spirit can flow through our words, words that can heal, that can build, like peace. You are forgiven. Let me help you with that. I love you. When a child is having a meltdown, flailing and angry, what do we say to them? Use your words. Use your words to express your feelings rather than acting out violently. So use your words when they can bring people together. But watch your words when they can divide people. The words you use matter. Don't use them lightly. They have so much power. Later this morning, we're going to celebrate communion, a meal that unites us with God, each other. Part of that ritual is the words, the words that make clear that this is not just any meal, that it is important. This is my body broken for you, he said. This is my blood shed for you. Fun fact, our nonsense phrase, hocus pocus, comes from a garbling of the Latin phrase, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. In traditional theology, when we say those words, the Holy Spirit makes this bread and wine more than bread. It makes them communion with God. This is communion. This is a meal that connects us with God, connects us with each other, because our words say so. For our words and the Holy Spirit that moves through them, thanks be to God and amen. Is come down, O love divine.
It is now the time in our service when we share our deep joys and concerns, silently or aloud, with God and with one another. I'll share those that I'm aware of, and I will share any that are posted in the chat. So if, you have, if you're at home and you have a uh, concern to share, please put that in the chat and I'll find those. And I'll then invite those in the sanctuary to share as well. God, heal our, he, he, he are, sorry, hear our healing prayers for Alan's neighbor, Maxine, who's grieving the loss of her companion dong, Mocha. My brother-in-law, Jim, who's experiencing long-term health concerns. Sarah and Sam's dog, Bean, who broke his wrist. Vanessa's friends, Barry, Lorraine, and Marilyn, who are all dealing with major health concerns. Bill Harwood and his wife, Elaine Hubert, who are, as he's treated for a serious can cancer challenge. God, hear our prayers for Sarah and her family on the death of her grandmother. Those who are feeling impotence and helplessness in the face of the hatefulness and loss, which seems never ending. Teachers everywhere and the students navigating fear and hurt this week and every week. Safe travels for, Ken, um, for Ashley. For my friend Bob and for all those who loved him, he died a week ago. For all victims of violence, for those who face oppression due to race, color, religion, culture, ability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Those struggling with mental health issues or substance abuse and addiction, they may find the help and support that they need. God, we give thanks for our congregation's June birthdays. Maggie offers, asks prayers. She's sick with pneumonia and is finally on the mend. Are there any in the room? We have someone in the, uh, with the microphone. So if you have something here, please raise your hand and I'll come to you. I have a couple. I know I've asked um, for prayers for my friend Kristen, who had brain surgery and then complications, and now she has COVID, so could really use prayers. And um, I have um, the little girl who lives next door to us here today, and I think most of you know she lost her brother in February, so I just want to still ask for prayers for the family. Thank you. Anyone else? One more look at the Zoom feed. All right. Let us pray. Loving God, listen to the prayers of your people. Comfort and nourish us in both our joys and our concerns, spoken or unspoken. And hold us tenderly as we face the many different experiences that life and being human can bring. Holy and gracious spirit, we're grateful for your presence as we move into this new week, the time that will bring forth its own sorrows and joys. Remind us to hold one another in love and prayer, reaching out as we are able, to lend a hand, offer support, or share in celebration. We give thanks for the blessing of this congregation in our lives and pray that we might be a blessing to others in return. In your compassionate name, amen. Now is when we receive offering or give thanks for our offering in appreciation for all that God has done for us and for this congregation. To support the ongoing work of this congregation, I ask you please to give in person, via mail, or via our website as you are able. If you're in the sanctuary, there's a box in the narthex as you go out. You can place something there. You can also find the donate link on our website. There's a link in the chat room if, you'd want to, if you want to give online. If you have any questions, please email our treasurer, John Tishi, our assistant treasurer, John Tishi. He's happy to help. 
and his email address is also in the chat. I now invite you to take a moment of silence in appreciation for the gift of this church and its many blessings in our lives. Please write. Please be seated. On that really weird Pentecost two millennia ago, Jesus' friends were sitting around the table telling stories about him when suddenly a mighty wind swirled through the room, bringing the Spirit of God to everyone. Now we are sitting around the table telling stories about Jesus. He's invited us to eat this meal with him. And maybe, just maybe, the Spirit of God will come to us too. Everything we need is here. Jesus is our host, and everyone is welcome. So men and women and everybody else, young and old and everybody else, come from north and south, from east and west, and gather around this table. God is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We thank you, God, for the gift of your spirits. It moved on the waters at the dawn of creation. It spoke through your prophets and apostles. It sustained our brother Jesus through his ministry and martyrdom. It moved his followers to sing your praise. It inspired our ancestors to do your work of justice. It continues to speak to us, through us, to your world of joy and pain. We thank you for your spirit which speaks your word and speaks beyond words. In gratitude, we join together with all creation and every time and place in this song of praise. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. On the night when Jesus ate his last meal, he gathered his friends around close by him and shared the feast. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, asking that whenever they do that, Later on, he took the cup of wine, blessed it, passed it around, sharing it, asking it that whenever they drink it, they remember him. This is my body, broken for you, he said. This is my blood, shared for you. So remembering Jesus, we ask the Spirit to move in this place to bless these gifts of bread and wine. May all who eat them, may all of us be filled with God, and may they be signs of life and peace for the whole world. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The table is ready, 
and everybody is welcome. There are elements at the front of the church and at the back of the church, so please go to whichever one is closest, take a cup and a piece of bread, and return to your seat. Once everyone has served themselves, we will eat together.
brothers and sisters, use your words. Watch your words, because words do things. They heal, and they can hurt. Use them as the Spirit moves in you to bring about God's reign.